Buongiorno e benvenuti. La sessione Keynotes sta iniziando nella sala 1. Grazie. Developers build the future. We take ideas and make them real. My job is to think, create, and solve for a living. Each step we take is possible because someone asked the questions. Why do we have to do it this way? What if we did it that way? Each step I take enables people to go further. Be creative. Change something. I'm working on blockchain that will change asset identity. Artificial intelligence to automate homes. Autonomous robots to improve efficiency. My app is advancing human rights. I build things to help connect people. Not everyone gets to build their passion. We share what we know. We share what we do. We try, learn, <laughs> try again. Make, break, build. Ciao, buongiorno Roma, and welcome to Oracle Code Rome. My name is Gerald Fensel, and I'm here with Steven. Very pleased to have you at our, um, our first Oracle Code event in Italy. Woohoo! <laughs> there you go, the first joke already worked. That's good. <laughs> so um, we're going to talk a little bit today about what it means to be a, a groundbreaker. Um, and the content which you see at the conference is all going to lead you down this path. You can, you can tell that um, you'll, you'll see a bunch of Gerald and I's fine artwork in this presentation. And this is how you know that we're, we're geeks and not artists. Or PowerPoint makers. <laughs> so um, this is, this is your, your average developer. And we're going to show you the technologies you need to learn at the conference today to become a groundbreaker, such as serverless. Exactly. So. We're going to take our average developer, and then we transform him into something like a superhero. And there's a couple of utilities that every superhero needs, right? Yeah, yeah, a few of them. And the first one is it's not this. This is a pile of computers, <laughs> which, of course, as you guys know, with serverless technology, you just throw away all your PCs, and then you've, you've got a good stack. Um, so actually, the way serverless works is what you're doing is you're creating small functions. You're deploying them into some large um, cluster of compute resources, and this is giving you a bunch of advantages over traditional technology stacks. You don't have to purchase servers up front. You don't have a monolithic architecture. You're not scaling by buying new servers. And you don't have to worry about latency issues since you have a large cloud infrastructure. So these are a bunch of the um, technical advantages that you're getting by moving to a serverless architecture. How many folks are already using serverless in the, in the audience? OK, so we have a bunch, of, a bunch of groundbreakers in the audience already. Here, here is a, um, a very realistic graph of what your, what your gains are going to be by going from serverless. So um, you can see if you actually bought servers, then you'd have additional infrastructure, which you'd be purchasing up front. 
If you go with the serverless stack, you're getting scaling as you need it um, incrementally. We have an open source technology at Oracle called the FN project, and this allows you to run serverless um, on our cloud, on Oracle Cloud, with our new cloud function stack, or you can also run it on your own on-premise infrastructure. Um, we released it first as an open source project, so the entire code base is open source, and you can run it wherever you want to, so it's entirely non-proprietary. And um, I believe we have a, a limited availability, or is it, is it, yeah, limited availability of cloud functions, which lets you run this on a distributed cloud infrastructure. So, the serverless technology is kind of like... Something that gets a boosted fast, right? Yeah, so now our, our um, groundbreaker has a, um, a Jetpack attached to it. All right, so tell us a little bit about um, containers, Gerald. Right, so next thing we're gonna add is a utility belt or something that helps us out to do accomplish anything where we want to run anything anywhere, such as containers. Who of you has dealt with containers already and Kubernetes already? Okay, good, very good. So, you know, if we look back in time, traditional deployment looked something like this. We had a server, we had an OS on top, and then we put our apps there, and then we always fought with the other apps if we needed to upgrade or something and they weren't ready. Then we introduced VMs where we said, okay, let's put a hypervisor in between and OS for each VM on top. And that was great that we don't have, didn't have to deal with the other applications anymore, but introduced more overhead. We had a couple of OSs now, the hypervisor in between, that basically took away some of our compute resources on the server. And serverless is basically taking this additional overhead of OS and hypervisor away to a very, very thin layer of a container runtime and that frees up some headroom for our applications, which we want, right, which is great. The other thing about containers is that they're very nice to package up and then just ship anywhere. So a lot of times people talk about containers and container runtime as ships, container ships, right? It's like... You can, you can tell another fine piece of artwork. So who, who here would actually ride on, on Gerald's little paper ship? Would anyone take a ride on... Yeah, not so many people. Sorry, Gerald. Yeah, so the issue with ships in general is that although we don't want it, sooner or later there does come the iceberg in, right? And this thing crashes and then it's everybody jump ship. Yeah, without the love story. <laughs> without the love story, yes. And of course, well, if there is no other ship, well, something like this happens, right? And we don't want this to happen ever again. And this is where Kubernetes comes in. Kubernetes allows us to run a fleet of ships and then move our containers or Kubernetes moves our containers as a ship goes down. So as a server or container runtime goes down, we can move those containers over to another ship in the farm. So, as I said before, containers is our... Our utility belt. Exactly, like where we just have all just the like, gadgets we Just like we Batman, need. except he has, he has cooler stuff in his utility belt, I think. All right, next thing we add is, what does everybody need? Digital assistants, All chatbots. Right. Talk us through no, that you, one. You get to do this one. I'm going to do that one. <laughs> uh, there we go. So, <laughs> digital assistants or chatbots. So we actually all know that. Who, who has not heard of chatbots or hasn't used a chatbot yet? Okay, I think chances are you all have used a chatbot. You just well, don't if you, know Well, if it. they haven't, they're going to get a chance pretty soon. Oh, don't spoil it. <laughs> So uh, chatbots are actually integrated in pretty much any messaging app or can be integrated in any messaging app that we have on our phones, such as Slack, such as WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, and so forth. And you can basically text with the machine on the other end and order stuff like flights or flowers or whatever. They also come in these little things and these little toys, which me personally, being in IT, I will never ever have in my house because it's already bad enough if my wife listens to me when I say something she shouldn't hear. And I certainly don't want to have anybody else do that either. <laughs> but they also come in. For example, the, the Pepper robot who we have here from SoftBank Robotics. Um, this is hooked up with the back end on our Oracle Digital Assistant cloud service. And then you can talk to Pepper and ask her questions about the, the conference or about other things in life. And she'll be happy to have a conversation with you. Probably, you know, more manageable than your wife in terms of her responses. Perhaps, yes. And so this is what it looks like. Pepper is there in the corner when you walk out to the left right there and you can chat with her. So our chatbots become the superhero's visor. It tells the superhero or our developer exactly what we want to know. We can just talk to it and it 
helps us find the villain. Yeah, just like Iron Man. Just like Iron Man, yeah. Next thing. Okay, that everybody so needs. Everyone needs, of course, blockchain. Um, so all of you know that this this is blockchain, right? Bitcoin. No, so. Who has Bitcoin? Okay. Okay. So a few people are, are admitting it, and you know, <laughs> the rest is like, no, no, don't mention it. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys are buying the beer. Well, actually, we're buying the beer for you guys because we we have a cool demo which uses blockchain. Um, and actually integrates with an IoT beer backend. Um, for those guys who raised their hand, um, you, you were rich for a few months. Now you're back to being normal like the rest of us because the Bitcoin value tanked. Now you can see the people that are smiling never have Bitcoin, the others that are not smiling, they're <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> but what's really interesting is not Bitcoin, but it's the blockchain technology which underlies it, which is useful for a whole bunch of other business applications. Um, at a high level, the way it works is you have a, a series of blocks, like a distributed ledger. You combine a bunch of transactions together using a Merkle tree, and you get a hash out of that, which gets hashed with a blo previous block, a timestamp, a nonce, and that becomes the next candidate block in the blockchain. And this is validated in the case of Bitcoin by miners, by proof of work, or if you're doing um, you know, enterprise use case, you might be doing something like um, Hyperledger or um, Ethereum, and then you're um, instead, you would have some sort of private network where you'd have um, different rules for arbitration. Um, these are the big differences between public and private blockchain, but if for a business use case, you'd primarily be using private blockchain because it gives you faster transaction times, control over data privacy, um, smart contracts, and the ability to control who is part of your business network. And we you have do agreed... Anything, can you do anything cool with blockchain as well? Yeah, yes, we can. Yes, like? we can. We can. We can make beer. So um, <laughs> this is a, a real use case, which we did with a brewery, which is across the street from Oracle headquarters, Alpha Acid. And um, we got their local hop supplier, malt, um, fa malt factory, and um, a local yeast provider to all contribute to a distributed ledger using Oracle Intelligent Track and Trace built on Oracle Blockchain Cloud Service. Uh, we also got sensor information from their um, brewing, so you could get the temperature and the pressure of the, um, of the process as they were doing the warding and the fermentation of the beer. And then this is information which you can scan on a QR code, and as a consumer, you can find out some of the cool, unique attributes of the beer which you're drinking. So you'll get to enjoy some of this beer in the exhibition hall, and we also have a great video from um, Kyle and the folks at Alpha Acid. So. Blockchain is kind of like a utility that helps us track the villain, right? So that we're on the yeah. right track. But it needs to be high up and needs to see everything, right? So it will be our drone. Exactly. We we need we need drones to, to look over us when Pepper's not watching us. <laughs> and then what else does every superhero need? Except Superman maybe. Transportation maybe? Transportation. Right. We need a cool car, right? A Batmobile that takes us to the villain that we can chase them. And this is where our autonomous database comes in, the first self-driving, self-securing, self-repairing database cloud service out there. Uh, really easy and fast to get started. It allows us as developers to basically not have to worry about the database any longer, which after 40 years of databases is finally the step that we're all looking for, right? So it's fastest time to use it, it provisions in seconds, you can scale it up and down online. You don't need a DBA necessarily helping you to connect or to tune and so forth. The database does it for you. And it gives you more than one data format. So you not only can you use relational tables in there, but also JSON, graph, and so forth. And we also have a low-code tool on top of it if you don't want to write code and just want to visualize some of the data. Now, to get started, you just have to answer six simple questions. Basically, where you want to put it, what name, database name, CPU, storage, and so forth, and off you go. And that becomes our Batmobile, as I said, right? Or? No, it's better than the Batmobile, it's self-driving. There we go. There go. Autonomous car. And okay, so. and with all of this, now we've transformed our, um, our wonderful developer art into a superhero, and you too can be a groundbreaker with some of the great technical sessions we have coming up, including an awesome presentation on microservices by none other than Graham Rocher.
who's the creator of Grails, and Micronaut. Graham, please join us on stage. stage. Give him a big round of applause. Thank you. Much. Thank you. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, switching over to the slides. So, the title of my talk today is Evolving Software for the Microservice and Serverless Era. Uh, for those of you who, do, who don't know me, uh, my name is Graham Roche. Uh, I'm a uh, software engineer at a company called OCI, Object Computing. And um, I created a couple of frameworks, Java frameworks, which some of you may have heard of. One of them is called Grails. Anybody heard of Grails in the audience? A few hands. Um, and the other one is Micronaut, which is a new product that's been out for a year or so. Uh, this year, I was uh, privileged enough to be the inaugural Groundbreaker Award winner. Um, so thank you uh, kindly to the kind folks at Oracle for uh, nominating me for and choosing me for that award. It was a remarkable privilege to be alongside four other Groundbreaker Award winners who uh, I felt humbled being next to, you know, the creator of Kafka and the creator of JRuby and all these amazing people. Um, so, uh, so yeah, do, do, do pay attention to that and become a Groundbreaker yourselves. Uh, in this talk, what I'm going to be talking about is uh, the challenges facing Java uh, and software in general uh, when looking at serverless versus traditional models. Um, We'll look, look at some emerging solutions for this, this space, uh, specifically Micronaut and Graal VM. And we'll do some code demos, because you know, nobody likes to be, like, likes death by PowerPoint, so we're going to uh, do some demos, which I'm sure you'll appreciate. So in terms of serverless, um, you know, serverless is a completely different architectural style. And there are you know, challenges. When you, when you look at existing architectural stacks and moving them to a serverless or a microservice scenario, um, existing tools are not really optimized for, uh, for specifically for serverless. If you think about the requirements for cold starts and low memory footprint, um, you know, when, so with things like serverless, typically your, your, your function is kind of kept warm by some kind of um, FAS system, whether it be open FAS or whatever, and uh, executed, and then it's kind of put to sleep as, as kind of paper use model. Um, so cold starts um, become increasingly important. And you know, this, this has an influence on the architectural decisions you make um, when choosing the technology uh, that you want to use uh, for developing serverless applications. Um, so Go, Node, etc., cetera, um, are typically better in, uh, today in this regard um, than, than Java in terms of cold starts. And maybe it's better one of these. Is that better? Less scratching? Yay. <laughs> Problem with beards, no? Never have one. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, uh, you know, you have folks like Tim Bray, fairly influential chap, not recommending Java um, at AWS's conference. Uh, crazy talk, in my opinion, but anyway. Uh, so, so, but it is true that we have to adapt, and you have to adapt, we have to adapt and think differently when it comes for, uh, to, to serverless models. So you, know, you have to optimize cold starts, like I said. Uh, you also have to you know, forget about traditional patterns. So like, things like connection pools don't really make sense in functions. There's no point in storing a pool of connections in a function when um, uh, you know, the function is going to go away and the pool has to be shut down. Um, local caches, in-memory caches, kind of become irre irrelevant. Traditional models in, you know, in Java applications, we have all these local caches to improve performance, but if the, if the process is going to away, there's no point in, in retaining those local caches. And your technology influences are going to be influenced by your cold start requirements. Um, microservices, uh, specifically with regards to deploying microservices into containers, 
um, is, you know, is also influencing existing architectures. So cold starts maybe are less important, but still important in, in a, in a container-based world in Kubernetes, um, where the container is the deployment model. But, you know, containers in Java require special memory management and special considerations when you define your, uh, your Docker file or whatever. Uh, Java's memory model is adapting to containers today, and there's new flags available in the latest JVMs to make it work better with containers. But you have to think carefully about memory optimization with containers, uh, and you know, that's yet another consideration that you have to think about. And if you look at traditional Java frameworks, you know, traditional Java frameworks, the popular ones, whether it be uh, Jakarta E or, or Spring, they are um, you know, optimized for, and built 10 years ago for a time where you know, we had big um, uh, servlet containers where you would deploy your application that would be always running. And you know, memory startup, not really, really particularly important in this scenario. And based on this design and the architectural constraints, the way they typically work is, if you look at how the work, something like Spring works, for example, um, it actually reads the, your bytecode, your Java bytecode, um, at runtime. Um, it will synthesize new annotations for you, for each, anna each, each annotation in your code base, uh, to support what's called annotation metadata. And this is, this is something that's um, done uh, for every single bean in your application, and it will build large reflection caches because you know, the way it's going to work out um, how your application functions is by analyzing your code base and looking at your annotations and so forth. For every bean, every method, every constructor uh, in, in your code base. So, um, you know, th this situation has left us with kind of tough technical decisions because you know, you have to choose the appropriate model for the job, and traditional frameworks like Spring, uh, like Jakarta EE, are typically not the best choice for something like serverless. Um, so, the, mic and the, re the, the reality is that, you know, the micro-reality, and if you're trying to achieve fast, cold startup, uh, fast, cold, cold starts, low memory consumption, is that, you know, frameworks that are traditionally based on reflection and analysis of annotations in Java become pretty fat pretty quickly in terms of memory. But Java developers you know, love the programming model and the productivity that some of these tools offer. Uh, so we kind of live with it. But is there any kind of why, you know, why, why can't we not be more efficient? Isn't there a way to be, to be more efficient? So, you know, Traditional frameworks, traditional Java tools, and so forth, there's typically this correlation in them between the number of lines of code in your code base and the startup time and memory consumption. So if, if you look at a typical Java application out there today in the wild, uh, whether it be based on Spring or whatever it may be based, based, be based on, as the line, number of lines of code go up, so does your startup time and your memory consumption. Um, and wouldn't it be nice if we could, you know, break this correlation so that, you know, your traditional Java application didn't have to consume so much memory? Really, if you look at, you know, technology stacks in Java, uh, in particular, you have really two groups of, of, of high product. You have these, up in the top right corner over there, you have these technology stacks that um, typically are high productivity and opinionated, and these are the ones developers love. They're the, the most popular uh, in the Java space stacks out there, things like Springs, things like Grails, things like MicroProfile. They provide more opinions, and uh, they provide high productivity levels. Um, and then in the bottom left corner, you've got like um, technology stacks, which are, which are your, like your I like to call them your do-it-yourself toolkits, where you can kind of put together your application manually. Um, and these are things like Vertex and Spark and Ratpack, and um, you know, there's all sorts of little HTTP toolkits tool out there that do this. And they don't provide the same productivity. You have to kind of do a, a lot of manual um, decision-making. They're not very opinionated. 
but they come with low memory consumption and startup time. And there's no, so you've kind of left with this choice with just existing Java tools in terms of either choosing low memory, but kind of having to do a lot of ma manual labor to get there, or um, you have, or you go for one of the high productivity tools like Spring or Rails or MicroProfile, and you end up with an environment that consumes consumes a lot of memory, which is not necessarily the most appropriate when you're thinking about serverless or you know microservices in containers. So what, what is the cause of these problems and wh why, 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 is, why do you get folks from, from Amazon criticizing Java and uh, unnecessarily? Um, uh, you know, it's a popular thing to criticize Java. Um, what, you know, but there are some actual fundamental architectural problems in Java that make it difficult for framework developers um, and users to create applications that consume less memory. So the, the annotation API, for example, in Java is, is, pre is pretty limited in that it kind of, there's annotations attached to fields, attached to classes, attached to different parts of the application. But there's no built-in way to query the annotations to find out what meta annotations are. There's, there's no way to um, kind of merge annotation data from interfaces and classes and fields and so forth. And it's, 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 it's really quite limited. You have to do a lot of reflective analysis on the annotation API to actually get a framework to do what you want it to do. Um, then you have things like type erasure. So, you know, the JVM didn't have, uh, Java didn't have generics before, and then generics were added later. And in order to support backwards compa compatibility with, ja with um, generics in Java, the, the actual types are erased. So if you declare like a field that is a list of string. Um, at runtime, that, that, that string is gone. Uh, that, that reference to that type is gone. Uh, it's not retained, and there's various interfaces and classes where you can kind of get access to it, but it's, it's very difficult. Um, reflection is also pretty slow, uh, and there's, there's, very, there's various ways in Java that you can improve that, you know, and there, there's been some innovations over the years to try and make that better. Uh, things like invoke dynamic and method handles and so forth. But fundamentally, for reflection, is always going to be slower. And it's also very hard to do closed world static analysis on reflection uh, because, you know, the more dynamic you make an application, the, the more difficult it is to optimize. Another major problem with, uh, in the Java ecosystem is reflective data caches. So every single library and toolkit out there seems to have like a unique reflective data cache. And it becomes a, a massive problem when you're trying to optimize memory. Uh, so for example, uh, you have some, you know, you have a, a reflective data cache for Spring for all its reflection da data. You have another reflective data cache for Jackson for marshalling JSON objects and back and forth. So, uh, so every time you, you marshal a JSON object with, you know, a class, say book, uh, it's going to you know, build out a, a whole bunch of reflective data and cache that data because you can't keep reading it and it'll cache it in a map and so forth. And the way the JVM works is that it, when, as soon as you read a, 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 a class by a reflection, it stores a reference to the methods and so forth using soft references. Um, now what soft references are is essentially uh, they don't get garbage collected until your JVM starts running low on memory. So you have this retention on reflective data and these reflective data cache because each different library and so forth is, rest is restoring a unique cache. Um, and reflection makes it very hard uh, to build a low memory footprint application um, because of all these caches. Class path scanning is also a popular feature. Developers like to be able to like, just define their classes, run their app, and it just works and it finds all the classes and so forth. But to implement class path scanning effectively, you have to allow the running application to scan the classes um, of, of, your, um, of, of your application at runtime, looking for the appropriate annotations and so forth. Um, and that makes it difficult to optimize um, you know, startup if you're scanning and doing I.O. or disk I.O. to, to read the annotations of your classes. Class path scanning is really slow. And dynamic class loading can be slow. Not always, 
uh, depends how much or how often you're doing slow dynamic, um, dynamic class loading, but it can certainly be slow. And it, dynamic class loading also impacts how easy it is to, for you know, uh, ahead of time compilation tools to optimize uh, your, your application cloud, um, your application. So uh, a question I often ask, ask pe people is, you know, if, you know, when the Kubernetes uh, d developers uh, decided to build co Kubernetes, if they had built Kubernetes using Spring or Jakarta EE instead of Go, which is a, uh, becoming an increasingly popular language because of its low memory footprint and so forth, what would have been the result? So you have Docker and Kubernetes running locally, which are each, each of which are made up of a collection of microservices. Many of you are, are probably have these, these systems running locally on your laptops, yeah? And the remarkable thing about these things is that they run locally on your laptop, Docker and Kubernetes, um, but it, they don't need you to have one of these as a laptop, yeah? Because fundamentally, <laughs> You know, Go is cons consuming very little memory, so you can have a, a whole suite of microservices running locally, and, and it doesn't require you, to, each of every, every one of us, to have a supercomputer super to run it. Um, and that, that is based on a technology choice of choosing Go at the time instead of a traditional Java framework. Having said that, Java's problems are also greatly exaggerated. Um, you know, people have been saying Java has been dead forever, which, you know, every, every, every time something new comes out, Java's, been, Java's supposedly been dead. Ruby on Rails came out, oh, this is going to kill Java. Uh, Node came out, oh, this is going to kill Java. Uh, you know, the, Java's been dead, if you listen to people out there in the audience, Java's been dead for like 20 years. And, and fundamentally, it's complete nonsense. Um, and the reality is, is that Java can be fast, um, and it can consume little amounts of memory. Uh, this has been proven time and time again. Have a look at Android, for example. Android has the same requirements as serverless, if you think about it, uh, and microservices in terms of you want that app on your Android phone to start up quickly. You want that app on your Android phone to consume a little amount of memory, yeah? Um, and I'll talk about Micronaut, Micronaut in a minute. But, you know, in order to achieve that, you've got to look at the tool set that you're using to build an application. Most existing tools for Java, and certainly the popular ones, are based around fundamental principles, which are the use of reflection, the use of runtime proxies, the use of runtime bytecode generation, whether it be bytecode, bytebuddy, or CGLib, or something like that. Um, and these are the things that lead to problematic memory consumption and problematic um, runtime performance. And Java has many, many, many advantages over other languages. It ha it's a mature, robust ecosystem. It, it's got outstanding uh, IDEs and development environments. Uh, and not just one, you got, you got so many of them. Um, you know, from, in, from IntelliJ IDEA to Eclipse to even Visual Studio Code uh, now supports Java. It really has so much code maintenance and refactoring. Like, we, we take it, Java developers take it for granted, but just being able to open up a class, rename a method, and, and have that refactoring propagate to the whole code base, that confidence of being able to change and maintain a code base um, and evolve it over time, uh, is not something that's you know just there for other tools and technologies. Developer availability, you know, look at this audience here. Uh, most most of you, I imagine, know Java. There's Java developers everywhere. Build system maturity. So, you know, Maven and Gradle and the Maven Central and the whole build ecosystem around Java is is light years ahead of of other, of other technologies. Uh, when you consider things like the battles that um, NPM and the Node community have gone through to, go, to get stable build tools and so forth. Diversity, so Java is so diverse. You know, it's, it's used in mobile, IoT, server side. Uh, you know, it's not just serverless. It's not just um, 
it's, it, it's not just microservices. Java is broad uh, and, uh, and diverse. And diverse also in terms of the languages that it's, it's able to run. You know, you got an amazing set of languages that run on the JVM today from Java to Kotlin to Groovy to Scala, Clojure as well, which I don't have that on the list, but there's, there's a whole, you know, even you know, JavaScript runs on the JVM. So, you know, it has a very rich ecosystem that, you know, is beyond anything else out there. Another thing I like to say is, you know, and I've heard a lot, a lot of people say as well is, um, you know, by the time a language like Go has all the features of Java, Java startup performance will match Go. <laughs> you know, in, in 2021 or 2022, by the time all of those things happen. So, and the other thing I would say is, you know, optimizing Java, optimizing Java and optimizing Java applications is an already solved problem, yeah? I, I brushed on this before, but uh, server -side, the server-side Java community has a lot to learn uh, from the Android community. Uh, Android uses ahead-of-time compilation extensively uh, to make sure that that Android app that you have running on your phone is as memory efficient, as fast, and starts up as quickly as possible. Um, they have tools such as Google Dagger, which is a compile time dependency injector, uh, which is reflection free. Uh, it's limited in scope to just DI, but it allows you to build applications, use dependency injection, all refl reflection free. And Android makes extensive use of annotation processes to pre-compute as much as possible as much as the application as possible, so that by, by the time it's running on the phone, uh, it's as optimized as it possibly can be. So, what I just mentioned this word, what exactly is ahead of time compilation? Well, ahead of time compilation is, you know, if you, if you speak to the folks at Graal VM, which I'll talk about in a moment, it's, you know, the, pre-computation of application code into native binary using closed world static analysis. Now that sounds very, very complicated. Uh, I don't know about you, but that, that, that's, a, that's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, but basically, all it means is, it's a fancy way of saying is, you know, let your compiler do the work at compile time so that at a runtime your application is more efficient, yeah? And with that, I, um, I wanna introduce uh, uh, the product I've been working on for the last uh, year and a half or so, which uh, it makes you extensive use extensively of ahead of time compilation. Um, so Micronaut is a new way to build applications um, for the server side that uses ahead of time compilation to pre-compute your application requirements. Uh, at a high level, um, Micronaut can be th thought of as a microservice and serverless focused framework, hence the branding, Micronaut. Um, but it's also a complete framework for any type of application. Uh, with, you know, whatever type of application that you want to build, uh, whether it be a CLI app or whatever, you can build with, with Micronaut. The, the, reason, the difference between Micronaut and a traditional framework traditional Java framework, uh, such as Spring, or, or CDI, or you know, Jakarta EE, is that everything, all the dependency injection, aspect oriented programming, AOP advice, configuration management, et cetera, bean introspection, everything is done at compilation time. So it's moved the job of, of the framework infrastructure from the runtime part to the compiler, yeah? Uh, Micronaut uses extensive AOT compilation, ahead of time compilation. So all of your dependency and, and configuration injection is computed at compilation time. Uh, all of the annotation metadata, so it'll pre-calculate from your classes all of your annotations, like if it, meta annotations. So it, for example, if you have a at transactional annotation and that transaction is present on another annotation, it'll pre-compute the annotation hierarchy and figure it out, figure it all out for you. It pre-computes uh, AOP proxies. So, you know, if you define 
Um, at, again, yeah, transactional example on, on, on a service, um, it'll, instead of relying on runtime proxies and runtime bytecode generation, it'll do that at the compiler level so that uh, when you compile your application, it's you know, a fixed set of classes and there's no dynamic class loading. All framework in, uh, infrastructure is pre-computed. Essentially what Spring and CDI do at runtime. So with Micronaut, you can build a whole bunch of stuff. You can build uh, microservices. You can build serverless applications. You can, you can build completely headless, HC, um, without an HTTP server, message-driven microservices uh, with Kafka or Rabbit, MQ. You can build command line applications. And yes, you can even run, run it on Android because we're efficient enough to, to be able to support running on Android. Anything with a static void main, uh, you, can run, you can build with Micronaut. So what is Micronaut really? Uh, I like to think about it as an application framework for the future. It's, it's, it's a set of building blocks that uh, inspire best practice so, such that you can build memory efficient applications on the JVM. So it, it uses no reflection. It's completely reflection free. Uh, it uses no runtime proxies. There's absolutely no dynamic class loading. All class loading requirements are pre-computed at compilation time. Um, it, it has an extensive API to do ahead of time compilation for, for, for other things. For example, one example of that is we have support for Swagger, which is open API. Uh, and it'll actually pre-compile your Swagger information at compilation time rather than waiting to do that at runtime and then consuming more memory. And of course, it lets you, lets you build microservices. <coughs> so Micronaut is, is pretty new. Uh, we open sourced Micronaut uh, in May 2018, so it's been nine months. Um, and the impact it has had on server-side Java has been remarkable to see over the last nine months. Um, and it's really inspiring a complete shift in the industry. Uh, uh, it sparked massive improvements from uh, big companies like Red Hat with Quarkus, which is a, uh, takes a similar approach by pre-computing your application requirements. Um, and it's inspiring Pivotal to, to improve uh, Spring Boot's uh, memory efficiency as much as possible and startup time. And it's, it's really created a massive impact and really put the focus on on the industry of server-side Java to improve, to improve <coughs> for the serverless and for the microservice use case. Um, and now I want to talk about another technology that is, um, that is up and coming as well and is also very much uh, based on ahead of time compilations. So Graal VM, uh, who in the audience has heard of Graal VM? Yeah, a few hands here. So GraalVM is, is a new uh, universal virtual machine from Oracle Labs. And uh, it's currently at kind of release candidate beta stage right now. Um, and it does a whole bunch of things. So it, it's, it's kind of a replacement for um, uh, the JIT in Java uh, in Hotspot. And, uh, but, and it also features a, a, a language framework called Truffle. It has implementations for, uh, for Ruby and Python, and, and it allows you to, uh, for languages to interoperate with each other. So for, for example, a Java application to call a JavaScript application and so, so forth, without any overhead in, in terms of communicating and type conversion and so forth. It also has another feature, one specific feature, which is just one part of GraalVM, the actual suite of GraalVM tool, tools is enormous. But it has a, a native image tool that allows you to convert Java code, um, Java bytecode, into a native machine image uh, using ahead of time compilation. And why would you do this? Uh, so I, there's some disadvantages to doing this. Uh, when you do this, for one, the compile times are, are quite long and you lose uh, certain features like write once, run anywhere, and you lose uh, things like uh, the JIT, uh, JIT, comp JIT compilation. 
but what you do gain is remarkable optimization in terms of startup time and memory consumption. So for example, with Micronaut uh, and Graal VM, uh, the startup time for a microservice is 20 milliseconds, which for a, which for a Java application is quite remarkable. Um, also memory consumption. Uh, I actually think that we, we put some more optimizations in. It's actually down to 14 meg the last time I took. So the actual native Im uh, image, when you run it, only occupies 14 megabyte of memory, which is, which is pretty, pretty remarkable. Uh, when you consider you know, a traditional Java application, uh, even with Micronaut, we're looking at around 70 megabytes of memory. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna do some uh, demos. Uh, and uh, show you some of the stuff I've been talking about, and we'll see how it goes. So, we, yeah. So I've got over here a um, Micronaut application, and what I'm gonna do is I'm going to enter, I'm gonna go into presentation mode. There we go. And uh, this, this is a, a Micronaut application, and you can see um, it has an application class which you can run. And if I run this application inside uh, my ID, you can see that uh, startup time is pretty quick, 945 milliseconds startup time, which is a lot faster than your traditional Java application, and the important thing is that the, as the application grows, because we're pre-computing everything, the compilation time doesn't get slower. Uh, the, the, the startup time doesn't get slower, sorry. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, to, to further this demo, I'm going to create a, uh, controller and this is gonna be a, a kind of a web controller, and we're gonna just do a little hello world demo. And what I'm going to do is create a person that I wanna greet, and they're gonna have a name. And we can generate some getters and setters. Um, so one of the things that, my, one of the features of Micronaut is uh, and one of the challenges with Java, which I mentioned before, is annotation metadata. So what does that mean? Uh, in, in a uh, traditional Java framework, uh, one of the things that you can do in Java is you can define annotations on a Java bean either on the field or on the getter. That's the rule that it, that it implies. So for example, if I wanted to apply some uh, validation constraints, you could apply not blank over there and you could say size on the method and the maximum size should be uh, 100 or something like that. Um, and you can see that I now have a problem. For, as a framework developer, I have a problem. Because in order to comp compute this annota annotation metadata, I have to merge. I have to, first of all, I have to look at the method, uh, which is public. And I can see that it's got a size constraint. Uh, OK, that's great. But now I, ask, I also have to reflectively access the private field to check the additional annotation metadata on the field, and I have to merge those together somehow at runtime. And in order to get the field, notice how the field is private. So uh, the field is private, so I have to disable you know, the, the Java's private reflective access, set the field to accessible to get it. Um, breaking encapsulation, uh, potentially the module system as well. Um, and all of that just to analyze what this class is doing at runtime, yeah? With Micronaut, I can add introspective to this, to this, and what that does is compute all of that annotation metadata and, ref and bean access at compilation time, yeah? And that's what I'm doing here. Then I can say, um, I can create a, like a greet response, greeting response, and it's gonna have some text, and we can generate a getter and a setter, there it is. And we can, we can create a post action that just submits the same URL and returns a greeting. Uh, and we're gonna greet a person like that. And uh, what we're gonna say is we're gonna create a new greeting. 
And we're gonna set the, the text of the greeting to be hello plus person dot get name. And we're gonna return the greeting. So that's, that's my simple controller action. Um, takes, uh, I'm gonna add introspective to this as well. There we go. And basically what it is, is it uh, maps to the greeting URI, takes a person, sets up a greeting, and returns the response. So how would I test this? Let me write a quick little test and it's going to be a greeting controller test. And uh, we're gonna make this a Micronaut test. And it's going to te test my um, controller. And uh, one of the nice features of Micronaut is uh, you can create uh, clients that are, that are interfaces that are pre-computed at, at compile time so I'm gonna create a client that's an interface. And uh, we can just copy this. You can actually share a, a parent interface um, if you want. And then I'm going to inject that into my test. That's my client. And uh, I'm going to say greeting client greet new person. Greet the person, and that's gonna give me a greeting response. And then we're gonna say assert equals. Uh, hello, John. Greeting dot get text. And we may wanna set the name of the person before we send it off, otherwise you're gonna get a validation error. John. So let's run this test and see what happens. And if the demo gods are with me, uh, we, we may uh, get a result that is, oh, the, the test passed. And now look, look at that. that. That test executed in 510 milliseconds, right? Uh, this is not a mock. This is not a pretend test. There's no mocking. If you don't believe me, uh, we can go into my logback file he here and we can add a, a new logger. That is uh, io.micronaut.http and set the level to be trace level logging. And we can run that test again. And you'll see that uh, the test it is now outputting my logging. And you can see it's spinning up the server. It's creating a new server. It's sending a request. It's receiving a response. Uh, at no point am I mocking everything. This is your real functional test executing your real code. And I think this is one of the revolutions that Micronaut is creating is that, you know, you no longer have to have a special mocking APIs to mock out your server that takes 10, 10, you know, 10 20, 30 seconds to start up. You can just write unit, your unit tests um, are fast and so are your functional tests. My functional tests are remarkably fast. So I, I can execute that and it, it sends a request to my controller, it receives the response, and, and I get it back. Now, that's my application done. What it, what, uh, if I want to build this into an actual kind of working application, how do I do it? So I, I can say Gradle W assemble, and we support Maven as well, so you can build that, that into, a, into a, a Maven project. And then, um, and then you can just run it as a, run the microservice uh, as a regular jar file and it starts up, um, you know, really fast. So if you want to then take that to the next level, uh, you can, at the moment I'm using, uh, what am I using? Uh, I'm, I'm actually using Graal as my JVM. You can build this into a native image. So I can say native image class, I'm gonna disable the server, uh, and I'm gonna say this, this is my, I wanna build uh, a native image from my application. And this is actually, this process, this is what I was talking about with Graal VM compile times, is this process will actually take a little, a little while. 
Uh, it might take several minutes, a couple of minutes uh, to complete, but this is gonna compute my application into a GraalVM native image um, uh, you know, that has this essentially an, an embedded JVM and so forth. And uh, it, it's doing what's call, what the GraalVM call, team calls closed world analysis, static analysis of the application. And this, this works really well when, the, when there's no reflection, no runtime proxies, no everything, because uh, you, know, you don't have to, you don't, GraalVM doesn't, it supports reflection, it, resport, it resport, supports runtime proxies, but you kind of have to tell it ahead of time where those things are. And that makes the whole process more complicated. While with this, uh, because Micronaut is not using any reflection, it's not using any runtime proxies, it's, uh, it's far more efficient and can build a native image into, uh, make big building a, a native image a lot easier than, than your typical technology stack. So uh, as you can see, it's still compiling. This is definitely moving your, your work into your compiler. Your compiler is gonna take a, a lot longer. It's converting this into a, a machine image that will only actually work on this Mac. Uh, so that's, that, that's an important consideration. If you, you, when you build your native image, you have to build it for the target environment. And, um, and yeah, essentially, uh, once it's done, uh, which I think it, it should be in a minute, you will have uh, what's called a, a greeting service. Um, there, it, there we go. It's built. So now I can just run my greeting service, and look at that. The service is up. Startup time is 26 milliseconds. Um, if I look at top uh, for my process chart, you'll see that my greeting service is this guy here. And you can see that it's consuming 15 megabyte of memory, consuming very little memory. And it's essentially the same application, uh, but uh, computed with GraalVM. So GraalVM is, is really, is really a promising technology and to keep an eye on, the, the technology is still very much in, in, in beta uh, and experimental, but it's, it's one of the most exciting, exciting things that are hap happening in Java right now. Um, Micronaut optimizes for GraalVM, but it also optimizes for regular Java. So whether you use, um, whether you use GraalVM uh, native or not, uh, it's uh, all Java, you're still getting memory, memory benefits. Um, I had another little demo, which I don't know if I have time for, but it's basically a serv serverless function, which, uh, which is over here, I think. Uh, let's see. And yeah, this guy, this guy is a serverless function, uh, which you could deploy, deploy to Project FN as a Docker image. And it shows the cold start performance of Micronaut with regular Java uh, when building functions. So uh, if I zoom in a bit, there we go. So if I execute this, this function, you can see that when I execute it, uh, it's really fast, um, even for a regular Java function. Uh, the cold start time is really low. If I open this function up in, in an IDE, you can see the implement implementation, and it's very similar to, to that microservice that I just showed you, except this is a, a function. So it, we, I have a, a greeting function that executes, uh, executes a greeting. It uses dependency injection to inject, um, inject the greeting service into the function. So it's using DI and, and, the, uh, and everything, and the whole thing executes very, very quickly. Um, I have a test that also ex uh, runs the function and, and, and tests it out locally, so I don't need to deploy it to my target environment. Uh, the function itself is just a normal bean that extends function initial initializer in Micronaut, receives a greeting service, and calls person. And uh, just by building that, I can build the application into a regular Java application, and I can pipe using echo um, the, the input into the application and it will read from system in and write to system out, which, would, which will allow you to deploy to many functions as, as a service systems, whether it be Project FN or OpenFAS or, or, or any of the popular um, FAS systems. So, um, Micronaut uh, and microservice cold starts and memory. 
So uh, in OpenJDK, uh, in OpenJDK, you're looking at uh, 800 milliseconds startup time for Java. And memory consumption, we allow, you can specify a maximum heap of only 10 megabytes to run a Micronaut app. Um, it's, it's around about 100 megabyte, uh, probably a little bit less depending what you're doing uh, to run a, a Micronaut microservice as a minimum uh, with, with OpenJDK. Um, both OpenJDK and, um, and Eclipse OpenJ9 have an interesting feature uh, which, which has a lot of potential for serverless and microservices, which is called class sharing, class data sharing. And what it allows you to do is, using AOT, pre-compute your, your classes so that um, when you start up your app, it's using like kind of shared classes that are already jitted, already, already pre-computed. And if I use that feature with Eclipse OpenJ9, and, and there's an equivalent feature in Hotspot, although it's, <coughs> it's a little bit more complex to use, uh, Micronaut startup time goes down to 300 milliseconds, and the memory consumption is only 70 megabytes. In the Graal native scenario, when you convert your, your Micronaut application to Graal native image, uh, what you have is a cold startup time of only 20 milliseconds, which is just crazy, and, um, and 15 megabyte of overall memory, which is, which is pretty awesome. And in the, in the cloud function scenario, a simple function, pure Java, is about 300 milliseconds cold start. If you, uh, some function as a service systems use something called API gateway, and um, in that scenario, it's around 800 milliseconds. And uh, if, you, if you involve Graal in your function, obviously that drops even further, uh, you know, sometimes as low as 150 milliseconds. Obviously with a serverless function scenario, it's a little bit higher because it has to spin up the actual machine or the container or whatever it is to get it operational. So, in summary then, um, Micronaut and Graal VM are leading the ahead of time compilation revolution on the server side. Uh, server side Java itself is adapting to the serverless world where, uh, you know, and microservice world where cold starts and so forth are, more, are becoming more, more and more important. And, you know, contrary to, um, to popular belief, you can build, uh, you know, efficient applications right now just through making framework choices that are the right way. And AOT sacrifices compilation speed to gain so much more, uh, you know, uh, but it's, it has the potential to completely revolutionize server-side Java and opens the world uh, for going na native uh, with Graal VM in the future. So thank you very much. That was my presentation. Um, <laughs> if you, anybody has any questions, uh, I'll be around at the conference all day. Happy to answer them. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Graham. Awesome job. Thank you. So, now that Graham showed us what a groundbreaker actually is and the cool technologies that he's using, it's time for our next keynote speaker who will show you how you can get all the gadgets yourself that we have showed you before and how you can transform from a developer to a groundbreaker. Please come, welcome on stage while he's setting up Bob Quillen, Vice President from Oracle's Developer Relation, uh, Revolution. We all good? Great. Good morning, everyone. Great to be here. Let's see Graham, another big hand. That was a great presentation. Good job on the demo. Thank you, Graham. Um, I'm, I'm super excited to be here. We have a, um, a lot of cool stuff to talk about this morning around code, culture, cloud. It's uh, three subjects that we've been talking a lot about since KubeCon in Seattle uh, back in December. Um, and, you know, my name is Bob Quillen. I'm really focused on cloud native uh, technology. I'll tell you a little bit about my history and what we're working on in particular. But it's something we're pretty passionate about of where the, uh, the market is today and where developers are. It's a golden age of development. 
Um, DevOps has brought us uh, a lot of cultural changes and opportunities to sort of move uh, application development forward. Uh, open source cloud, cloud native technologies have really come to the forefront in the last few years around, we've seen actually in the last couple of presentations here, Docker, containers, serverless. Um, and then also we talk about the power of the cloud. All these three things are working together in a, um, a pretty unique way. And we'll talk about you know, how they're helping businesses, helping the helping developers, uh, sort of the people, um, and all the elements that kind of make up the development process and the life cycle. But also talk about some of the challenges going forward. And although there's a lot of good news about how we're uh, moving forward as an application development community, there's a lot of challenges uh, of what's coming next. And we'll talk about how we're addressing those challenges as a group, as a community, uh, but also at Oracle Cloud and the OCI Oracle Cloud infrastructure team. All right? Oops. Whoa. Quick trigger finger there. Okay. So, um, so yeah, I talked about uh, three major topics today, uh, and they'll cover culture, code, and cloud. Uh, the cultural part is really around DevOps, and where DevOps has come over the last probably five to 10 years, it's kind of part and parcel to everything that we've done. I've done a lot of startups in my career, and uh, especially over the last 10 years, DevOps is kind of native to what we do. Um, it's kind of in the DNA of how we build startups and sort of get uh, technologies off the ground, but there's a lot of cultural changes that's affecting DevOps. Um, there's some great sessions coming up today around DevOps, around Site Reliability Engineering, SRE, which I highly recommend. Um, but DevOps is morphing into DevSecOps, into SRE, into AIOps, NoOps. So there's a lot of different uh, uh, ways that DevOps is morphing, but it's really around making Dev and Ops work together in a more traditional life cycle and moving forward in using these new technologies that are coming out. On the code side, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, CNCF, is doing a lot of work around containers, Kubernetes, and building up serverless and the functions on top of that and that whole stack. A lot of sessions today on that that we'll talk about too. And then the cloud itself is providing that foundational infrastructure to drive that forward. So, so how do we get here? It's, it's really interesting if you take a look over this for the last 20 to 30 years. If you look across this slide horizontally, you see three major movements that have happened uh, for sort of application development and sort of infrastructure and IT over the last you know, 20, 30 years. And it kind of spanned my career too. It's kind of where I got started back in you know, the 90s, 80s, 90s time frame. We had development processes that were waterfall oriented, um, monolithic architectures running physical servers in a mainframe environment. And if you kind of look at each of these different kind of verticals or columns, they work with each other and create a um, kind of an integrated kind of uh, way of amplifying each other. Each of these different functions uh, help the other grow forward. And as we get another major wave, they all work together. So the second major wave then is around agile development, um, N-tier, client-server architectures. Uh, virtual servers going into the VM world, so we're now we're going from physical to virtualized server environments in a more hosted environment. Um, I spent a lot of my career managing these kind of environments around virtualization and application infrastructures. And as you kind of work your way across these different trends, you know, from a time perspective, it really changes what we manage, too, and the scale of what we manage. We kind of move into this final phase here where we are right now, kind of the state of the market today application infrastructure development moving into DevOps and DevOps methodologies. We'll talk a lot about that in the next few slides. Microservice architectures. We just saw a lot of stuff around microservices in the previous presentation. Containers and cloud. So each of these kind of functions across the board amplify each other and help us kind of change how we develop, change where we run, and also change what we manage and the scale of what we manage. Moving from managing to be physical servers and monolithic applications the little microservices that are running everywhere. So the challenges change as the time changes going forward. So, you know, my career kind of follows that, that set of uh, those trends, too. I came out of an engineering background, uh, worked as a software engineer for many years, uh, mathematical science, electrical engineering. Um, and my career kind of follows automation and orchestration uh, life cycle that's going on for the last 20 or 30 years. 
kind of started off in the networking space, network management, SNMP management, worked in network monitoring, worked my way kind of up towards the application stack as I got from networking up to the application level for application discovery. EMC and Layers was a big virtualization management technology. And Layers was a startup, got acquired by EMC. We got spun off to VMware. So I spent a lot of time in the virtualization space. We began to see that transition moving from virtualization up to the cloud. So as I moved up to Copper Egg and Stack Engine, uh, these are more cloud-oriented technologies, now container-oriented technologies. And all these things share a, a level of automation, a level of intelligence, a way that, you know, as the market has changed, the challenges have changed, what we manage needs to change, too. I've done over 10 startups in my career, lots of different acquisitions. Stack Engine is the most recent one, so we were founded in 2014. Uh, we were acquired by Oracle about three years ago. And a lot of the container technology you find at Oracle around our container engine, around Kubernetes, comes from that original Stack Engine technology, and the team had developed it, and we're based in Austin, Texas. So that's kind of how I got here today, and uh, maybe give you a little background of how, you know, what I'm thinking and kind of where I come from. So I'm going to jump into DevOps and talk a little bit about sort of why DevOps is important, some of the benefits of it, maybe some ways we haven't looked at it, kind of based upon a lot of the research that's going on. If you think about, you know, cats and dogs, DevOps working together, mass hysteria, really it's kind of where DevOps, you know, 10 years ago, these were two different divides. We build applications, throw them over the wall, IT had to manage them, there's lots of finger pointing going on. The DevOps life, life cycle has really changed that a lot. Uh, so there's been a lot of research uh, that's been done, in particular by the DevOps, DevOps Research Association, Association, DORA. Jez Humble, uh, Gene Kim, and I highly recommend if you guys have a chance, just, just Google it. It's the uh, State of DevOps Report. They do one every year. They talk to thousands and thousands of practitioners. These practitioners are um, guys that are doing DevOps every day, and they model different competencies. They talk about you know, what's making these teams successful. Uh, they talk about what are the, the patterns they use to be successful. And you kind of can see in some of the details up here, and what are the technical and then the business benefits of DevOps itself? If you take a look at the, uh, the first row up there, you see it going from, uh, for de development frequency, going from months to weeks to hours to a daily kind of uh, deployment process. You're doing over 200 times more deployments if you're in the high IT performing category than the low IT performing category. Uh, lead time for changes, how long it takes to create change and put a change request in, months, weeks, to hours. Massive benefits in terms of how you can adapt to the business, how the business can leverage software, all the work that we're doing, in a more aggressive way to drive the business forward. Mean time to recovery, days to hours, change failure rate. You see the different uh, benefits happening as you work your way down that stack. Um, the, uh, the amplification you're getting within the organization is not only around deploying more frequency, more frequently, uh, early and often, but also around how you're um, adapting to changes and reacting to changes that occur. There will always be changes, there will always be failures, and then how you adapt to those changes. Those are key business benefits as people look at why should we do DevOps. They really do help the business deploy more frequently, get applications out, get more value from the de development that we're doing as a team. What's also key, and I, this is like also something that people don't really talk about, is you know, what are the, the people benefits? So you, know, you take a look at the research they've done, it's like two times more likely to recommend uh, the work that you do in the workplace you go. So people are more happy as being part of DevOps. So why is that? A lot of it's because um, you don't have to work on a lot of the main mundane tasks. You do, you do less redundant work. You do, a lot of less uh, recovery from failure. So there's, it's a better place to work. Uh, you have a bigger community around open source. There's more people you're working with. You have more job mobility. So there's business benefits and there's people benefits. So the people are happier, the business runs better. And the work they've done is, is critical in terms of understanding what are the patterns that make DevOps successful. And that's the question we get a lot. Why are people being successful with DevOps and why people are having trouble with it? Well, a lot of it comes down to automation. 
We'll talk a lot about automation later on in the presentation, but what are people doing in terms of being successful in DevOps or automating configuration management, they're autom automating testing, they're automating deployments. So automation is a key pattern, and in investing in automation and investing in people kind of goes hand in hand to make DevOps successful. The other thing they do is they start looking at, in these studies, what are the patterns, if you work backwards, in order to get to the end here of having less development pain, better IT performance, what are the things that make you successful? And they kind of use some backward chaining. So if you work backwards from sort of, you know, right to left here, you can see that one of the first things that makes people successful in IT performance is around uh, having lean product management. So we think about lean development, but product management also has to be involved too. So if you think about where DevOps has been successful, it's not only development teams, but it's also the product management teams that are being uh, supporting the development of the overall software application. Also, what are technical best practices? We talk about automation. Um, shifting left on security, DevSecOps. If you guys are looking at DevOps, DevSecOps, shifting left on security is a huge, another wave that's happening today and focusing on security. Finally, we take all the way back to the beginning here, and I talked to a lot of CIOs and a lot of directors around what makes DevOps successful, and they focus a lot on their teams. A lot of it's around leadership, visionary leadership, setting inspirational leadership, top-down leadership. So it is a, a pervasive cultural change that needs to happen. Development teams, product management teams, and also executive teams. Together that makes that most successful. So I highly recommend looking at the DevOps reports, understanding what makes these things work, and it's kind of a, a great place to get deep research around the technology. So. All right, so that's culture. We're gonna hit code and clouds, or do the three C's as we work through this process. So we talk about now code and what's happening in open source. We got a lot of uh, F Society and Mr. Robot here, but the idea that what's going on in uh, cloud native computing around open source is quite the revolution if you think about it. Um, Docker, Kubernetes, and all the tools that kind of come around that have really opened up uh, so sort of the open source world and the development world to almost everybody. Um, startups can use the same technology that Google and Netflix and uh, the larger technology companies are using to run their large web scale infrastructures. It's kind of exciting times. Um, on your laptop, you can run the same technologies um, as any large organization and it's something that's being shared across um, worldwide in a global environment. When we started Stack Engine, that was back in 2014, this is back in the early days of container management and Docker. We went to the first Docker con in San Francisco and it was like 500 people. And then uh, you take a look at what's happened since then as we kind of moved out of this container and Docker adoption phase into more of a Kubernetes DevOps phase, I'd say. Uh, KubeCon now is, was of over 8,000 people in Seattle and Barcelona coming up in May, which I hopefully we'll see many of you there. Um, that's gonna be over 12,000 supposedly. So the expansion of this technology and kind of the transition that's happening from kind of the Docker timeframe, which is very developer focused, very laptop focused, kind of getting everything off the ground, building kind of dev test applications. Now we're moving into sort of a more mature phase, kind of the production level phase. So now I've got Kubernetes, how do I orchestrate that? How do I monitor it? Where do I do logging? How do I actually, do tracing in that kind of environment. So we've kind of now worked, I say in terms of where we are in this uh, migration and this, this journey, we're kind of in the middle phase of going from the development phase into this now DevOps production phase. What comes next? Well, much more focus on the managed services, the business aspects. You see us now going from not just containers, not just orchestration to talk about service mesh, talk about serverless, talk about IoT, talk about how AI and big data work and all that. So we're getting into much more sophisticated kind of upstack conversations. And what's happened kind of on the base level um, becomes much more foundational, much more plumbing. 
Um, it's still important. There's still a lot of work happening at the container and the orchestration level. A lot of the exciting work is happening on top of that. So we're really excited about where this is going as a, as a market, as a community, and uh, uh, where it's going forward. So the, uh, the goal then, and it's kind of the, the vision is, this is an open source world. And you need to have open source technologies, you know, really focused on not just, you know, proprietary level technologies, but unforked open source that allows you to have choice as a customer. So when the, if you take a look at open source, and Kubernetes is a good example, there's now certified Kubernetes services provided by every single cloud provider, and a lot of the on-premise cloud provider, on-premise, you know, hybrid cloud providers too. Um, so you can run these applications anywhere. So why run on a single cloud when you now have the op opportunity and choice to have a multi-cloud strategy, to use a hybrid cloud strategy? And that's kind of, you know, the open source drives choice from a developer perspective, from a compliance perspective, from a regulatory perspective. So it gives you choice. And I think that puts us in a position as a market also to be less single cloud oriented, where before we had a lot of risk and there was you know, fear about choosing multiple clouds. Now, since everyone can run Kubernetes anywhere, it's certified, it's open source, it can run in different environments, you now have the opportunity to have a multi-cloud, hybrid cloud. Use the strategy that's important to you, and open source provides that level of choice. Okay. A key indicator, I think, and it's kind of fun to look at is, you know, <laughs> you look at history, this is from 2016, what were the top ways that containers were being used back then, way, way back three years ago. And it's primarily around um, development, dev tests, CI, CD, DevOps, kind of the core structure of what was early on in that phase and that journey we looked at. Um, so a lot of the early work was just, you know, using things that we know that, that is kind of less risky in terms of the business, less risky in terms of production, uh, less risky in terms of building new applications. So, you know, refactoring old legacy apps or building new microservice apps was kind of low on the scale there, right? So if you take, now, what's interesting in a recent survey just a few months ago, you know, we're seeing still development tests and POC being important, There's still high levels of use there. But if you look at the rise in production use of containers and Kubernetes, you're seeing a huge upswing now in terms of production use and kind of an indication of where the market's going. We've done dev test, we're comfortable with it, we're starting to use it on our laptops, locally, on-prem, and now out to the cloud, and you can see a good mix of a public cloud, on-premise, and, and private cloud environments, so. Kind of an eye chart here, but what's important is also, is within each of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, the CNCF projects, some of the growth areas outside of just Kubernetes and containers are around the more production level things like Prometheus, around Zipkin, you know, monitoring, tracing, logging, all the stuff that goes around, now I have an application, I built it, it's running, where do I and how do I manage that? How do I get observability and monitoring? And to me, this is a great sign of the uptake. It's indicative of now I'm not just worried about developing it, but now I have to manage it and run it. And it's moved out of the development phase into a broader phase. And I think a lot of the things that we're seeing from a, from a developer perspective, from an enterprise perspective, mirrors that too. And we'll talk about some of those trends in the upcoming slides. So He-Man, she -Ra, we have the power now to do some amazing things in the cloud. We talked about culture and DevOps. We talked about code and open source. So now, if you think about it, it's, it's something that we assume, but the power that's available in cloud technologies and the public cloud today it's almost hard to fathom. Um, the the low latency, the CPU performance, the high availability, disaster recovery that's available. Whoops. Go back. Whoops. There we go. Um, there's a lot of compute available. You think about the, the models. This is around just Oracle Cloud infrastructure, but it's mirrored across all the different cloud providers, is that you can have something that supports small applications in terms of web applications on the VM level, but we're also working with a lot of people who are doing big data, AI, ML, 
health sciences applications, financial applications that are up on the top level. So the spectrum of compute that's available to you as a development team, this is hard to imagine. And you can also begin to fit uh, based on what you want to do and what you can do uh, based, you know, with all these different shapes that are available on the IS side. That also gives you full access to not just the compute side, but high values of high bandwidth network, highly secure network, storage, uh, networking, all that infrastructure is available for you to grow and, and expand your cloud usage. So all that stuff was not available five to ten years ago as a developer. Now it's instantly available. On demand, elastic services, compute, storage, networking, and then all the container and open source technology goes on top of that. It's a huge win-win. So. so that's great news. We've talked about DevOps, the power of DevOps, how it helps the business, how it helps the people, um, the patterns that make that work, open source, how it enables choice, uh, sort of the evolution of cloud-native technologies. Uh, talk about the power of the cloud, how it gets you going. But, you know, that, that's great. And I think that's kind of been the first phase of cloud native that we've seen. We kind of, you know, I think at, if you went to KubeCon or saw some of the results that came back from the December KubeCon, it was a huge kind of celebration of this first level of success. All these things came together. We kind of talked about it at the very beginning. Microservices and DevOps and containers and cloud, and they all kind of came together. Um, and everyone's kind of super excited by that. But the, there's a bunch of challenges ahead. There's dragons ahead, and we know that's coming too, uh, up, upcoming episodes. So, um, so if those are the opportunities, where are we now as a community? And then what do we need to push through these new challenges going forward? So um, in a lot of the recent surveys, uh, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation surveys in particular, are showing that uh, cultural change, lack of training, complexity, these are key issues now that are facing communities today trying to adopt these new technologies. Not surprising, there's exciting new technologies, but what's gonna prevent us from expanding it and having another uh, you know, level of effect that so uh, amplifies all the things that we've had going forward? So we look at cloud native, we think we're actually at a crossroads here of how do we expand it? How do we get a bigger tent that gets more people under it, uh, that supports more different types of technologies, um, and that deals with not only the technical challenges, but the people and cultural challenges too. So the first issue that was mentioned in that survey was cultural change for developers. In Oracle, we work with a lot of different kinds of teams. I work with a lot of startups and a lot of enterprises, and I see the full spectrum of teams that have been using cloud native from day zero to folks who are now taking database and Java applications and web logic applications and trying to move them forward also in some of the largest organizations in the world. So you kind of get that full spectrum that a lot of development teams are trying to figure out how to take these technologies and move them into a cloud-native world. They understand the value of DevOps and, and, and containers and cloud, but they need to move them forward. They also need to, secondly, address all this complexity. If we take a look at the CNCF landscape, there's a lot of activity there. There's a lot of different kinds of new services, and every day there's new projects that are being brought into sandboxes that are maturing, that are going to graduation. So there's lots of different technologies that you have to choose from. And finally, there's a lot of teams that have then, just to get past these culture change issues and complexity issues, have chosen one cloud, a single cloud strategy. And that's something I think undervalues all the potential that comes out of the open source and the cloud native and the DevOps world. If you, use, if you build all this infrastructure and all this choice and culture up and you choose a single cloud, it kind of ruins you know, the part of the point, which is that you have choice to run anywhere you want to. You can run this anywhere that you can, so why just choose one cloud when you could have multiple clouds to work with? So I'm gonna work through each of these different technologies um, and these different challenges. Uh, and first we'll talk about DevOps, cultural change, and how to think more inclusively. And I think that's the next challenge, is that um, sort of the, the DevOps has, has created a, a great cultural model. How do we now expand that to create a bigger tent to bring more teams in? Um, how do we get on ramps that get more of the WebLogic teams and the Java teams, sort of Graham just went through? These new technologies are helping people get more Java into microservices, Java teams into serverless, WebLogic teams into that. Um, so part of the challenge is how do we get that next wave to be even bigger than the last wave that occurred? So one of the things that we've done in the last couple of years is uh, 
a set of technologies around web logic and building a, a web logic Kubernetes operator that allows you to run is web logic applications in the context of Kubernetes. And what we're finding is teams that run web logic now understand web logic, they can keep their infrastructures as they were, but start running them under the context of Kubernetes. And it's a great transition way to you know, take something you know, which is an uh, application infrastructure, not break it apart into microservices immediately, but begin to use some of the underlying technology in the context of Kubernetes. There's some very large organizations, there's some great use cases and, and studies that are coming out of folks that are using this as a way to you know, bridge the gap and get an on-ramp onto uh, this next uh, set of technologies. So now I can take my WebLogic apps, run them in a cloud-native context, and I can learn Kubernetes from a WebLogic context. Uh, there's some great uh, blogs that have been written. You go to the GitHub site, uh, get some information about it. And for the last about year and a half, this work has been uh, progressing with some very large organizations, some startups. And you'll see some, some really good examples of how to uh, take WebLogic and move that into a cloud-native environment. We've uh, also done some work recently around Helidon. Uh, so uh, uh, my cloud native team has uh, done some work around Helidon also to bring that into Kubernetes. So there's a lot of uh, different uh, blogs and, and code snippets that you can pull out of our cloudnative.oracle.com site around that too. Helidon is a microservice framework for Java. It allows you to take your, what you know about Java and run that in a micro, microservice world. So another good example of taking a technology set similar to what we saw with Micronaut and Graal VM, Helidon, all these tool sets allow you to take what you know about Java, take Java teams and move them forward in the cloud native world. So now Helidon running on top of Kubernetes, using containers, some really cool technologies. They're beginning to intersperse what has been you know, separate worlds and bringing them together into this next generation of larger, more inclusive cloud native technology sets. We're about to open source a uh, Oracle Kubernetes service broker, um, which will allow you to connect into other applications, one of which will be our autonomous database. So what we're finding is as people adopt autonomous database, they want a modern application architecture. If they want to have the autonomous database, then they want to run that with Kubernetes. Makes perfect sense, right? I'm building a new application. I've got autonomous database. I want to have orchestration and automation be automated too. Uh, so these two worlds coming together, we have our autonomous database connecting to a service broker around Kubernetes. That's being open source probably in the next day or two, so look for information about that. Um, another great way to bring the database world into the Kubernetes and the container and cloud native world in a very natural way so you can build modern applications using the best database technology, self-driving, self-automating, et cetera, into uh, what's happening in cloud native. So another exciting development, building a more inclusive environment to bring cloud native to the broader enterprise community. And when we think of inclusive, we think of and. And that means you know, modern and traditional, on-prem and cloud. And on-prem and cloud is basically how you define hybrid, right? And so uh, we do a lot of work with the Oracle Linux team who has a full cloud native stack that can run on premise um, that matches up with the cloud native stack that's running on top of OCI. So now Oracle offers both ends of the spectrum. You run on, on prem, you run on the cloud, which gives you a hybrid opportunity. And the use cases then are things that we've been trying to get to for the last five to 10 years around hybrid. I want to develop in the cloud and run on prem. I want to develop on prem and run in the cloud and do bi directional based upon my use case. Maybe I have regulatory use cases. Maybe I, just, I have some. QA test, that's uh, disposable technologies. I want to run with uh, some cheap VMs in the cloud and then want to run on-prem with my high performance uh, applications uh, on-premise. HADR applications where I'm running HA, HA and disaster recovery up in the cloud and then I, uh, to support my on-prem applications uh, on site. And then you start finding some more sophisticated applications with hybrid where you do some um, more, ah, orchestration, you start looking at uh, moving uh, workloads around. But those first three are pretty basic ways to take advantage of hybrid cloud uh, using open source technologies that can run on-prem, run the cloud, and run in a consistent stack that's, for example, Kubernetes compliant in both cases. So. so we talked about you know, how do we deal with being more inclusive and getting more kind of the cultural change addressed by 
you know, connecting into um, some of the more traditional enterprise technologies and bringing them into the cloud. The second approach is how do we deal with complexity in the second issue. Complexity is dealing with all those different um, technology sets that are, that are emerging. Um, one thing over the last five years we found is that there's a lot of DIY going on, do it yourself. Uh, it was the only way you could do Kubernetes and Docker and containers. So what's happening now is that you have the opportunity to build managed services. And those managed services prevent you from having to learn all this. This is great. There's a lot of open source cloud native technologies that are out there. But, you, but what we hear from customers is that I, I don't know, I don't have time to learn it. There's a large, large learning curve. How do I hire for that? Um, what managed services allow you to do is leapfrog what a lot of the traditional technology um, guys who have been doing this themselves, um, they can, you can leapfrog that and actually start using managed services. So what is a managed service? Typically what you have to do is manage yourself and learn all this technology um, to stand up Kubernetes, to stand up the, man the masters, to stand up the etcd servers, to keep that up and running. You become a Kubernetes expert, not an application expert. Now, over the last probably 12 to 18 months, every cloud provider has a Kubernetes service. So we find both communities, the, the communities that built their own Kubernetes ran it themselves, want to stop doing that. They want to throw that away. That was taking a lot of resources, a lot of time, a lot of effort to keep Kubernetes up and running. Then there's a larger set that never learned all that technology about how do I stand up Kubernetes. They want to leapfrog all that learning curve and go directly into a managed service. So it's a win-win for both sides. The managed service gives you all that kind of uh, support and training and uh, you know, out of the box. And you know, OCI as a managed Kubernetes service, highly recommended you take a look at that. Um, that allows you to have cloud, a cloud provider managing your masters, managing your etcd servers, keeping it up and running across availability zones, uh, doing the upgrades for you. In the cloud native world, every three months there's a, a new release keeping up to date with the releases, keeping up to date with all that new technology is a big overhead. People have done it, people still keep doing it, but a managed service really helps you get past that. And I highly recommend not going through all that pain that many of the folks went through for the last few years now that the cloud providers are offering managed services around that. So, so you know, I talk a lot about Kubernetes and containers, but there's a lot of new uh, DevOps services and managed services being offered. Uh, we have a new resource manager, which is Terraform as a service. So it's an automation service that's just recently uh, released on Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. Uh, we've talked about the FN project and Oracle Functions. Uh, that will go GA probably in a couple months. Uh, it's available, limited availability now. So that's serverless functions. We have streaming, we have events. It's a whole bunch of new upstack application technology sets that are being offered at the top of OCI. Uh, so managed services provide that leapfrog, provide that acceleration, allow you to get through all that um, very quickly. So. so we talked about being inclusive, uh, having managed services to help you be more sustainable. And the final thing is about being open. How do you um, take better advantage of these open technologies? Um, and one thing I, I, I can't help stress enough is that once you move into a, a, a more ambitious DevOps culture, adopting CNCF and open source technologies, do yourself a favor and look at all your cloud options. Many folks have a single cloud environment. They found themselves becoming experts in proprietary APIs. Um, they find themselves getting locked into these technologies. But open standards, open source enables choice. It allows you to run anywhere you want to. On-premise, hybrid cloud, public cloud, multi-cloud, you should have that choice. So don't limit your, yourself to only a single cloud provider. Having multiple cloud providers is, probably the, is what we see as the future, because it's the logical progression as you start doing DevOps technologies, as you start using open source te cloud technologies. This allows you to choose wherever you want to run. So don't limit yourself, because that tends to have uh, sort of negative effects long term. The idea that with open technologies now, they're more inclusive. We talked about how you bring WebLogic in and Java in and database technologies in. So it's modern and traditional. Um, and it enables native integrations. 
A lot of the work that we do in the Cloud Native Labs team, and we'll see some um, later on in some of the presentations, is allows you to integrate a lot of these open source technologies because they, put the, they work together as a stack. It's a jigsaw puzzle that fits together very nicely. So there's natural native integration that comes from these technologies. They're designed to integrate together already. So what's next? What do we recommend and where do you go from here? The, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of resources that have been put together for you guys uh, for the, um, in the industry. So CNCF has a whole trail map uh, that kind of walks you through how to get uh, through the cloud native jungle, so to speak. They have certification and training. Uh, there's some great LinkedIn training that a lot of our team has put together. Uh, there's stuff on different blogs. There's meetups. Um, I know when we got going with Stack Engine and a lot of the work in Austin, uh, a lot of it was just local meetups. We had a DevOps meetup, a Docker meetup. We actually started the Kubernetes meetup in Austin. So, uh, and that's where a lot of us learned um, about the technology from other folks in the community, and that's where the, the word spread organically. And, that, and we find a lot of people come into those meetups, and they, they know kind of software from where they've been working in the past, and they want to learn more. So it's not just a bunch of really you know, smart uh, folks who are already doing it. There's lots of people coming in to learn, and it's a very open community where the learning is, is the most important thing. The networking is the most important thing. So I think those meetups and those local meetups, I highly recommend it. DevRel teams, developer relations teams, you know, at Oracle, at AWS, at Google, at Microsoft, there's tons of DevRel resources out there. These, te these teams are there to help you. And uh, it's amazing the amount of resources that have been put out in the last, I'd say, 24, 12, 12 to 24 months uh, that really can help you kind of move forward really focusing on the issues that are out there in terms of complexity and training and helping you through that. I would look, you know, say look at developer.oracle.com, uh, great resources there, cloudnative.oracle.com, where my team works. We have a lot of blogs, a lot of uh, uh, solutions. Here's a lot of the integrations that we worked on, and a lot of them are focused on not just on Kubernetes and containers, but also on so the upstack issues around how do we get Java, how do we get MySQL, how do we get uh, WebLogic working. How do you monitor, do tracing, logging, et cetera? So really interesting uh, challenges that are ahead. And you know, we're, we look forward to help you with those resources and help you through that process. So, so you know, just, just to wrap up then, you know, we talked about three major trends that are happening for developers that create this golden age for development. Uh, culture, code, and cloud. Uh, I'm a huge DevOps fan, and we've seen DevOps kind of now move into some different kind of areas to really help the community move forward. Cultural change is a challenge, but the more inclusive we are with Cloud Native, the more people can get involved in, in the DevOps movement. Open source, code, the complexity around that and some of the fear factor around uh, open source cloud and open source code can be addressed by using managed services. I think that's the next major wave is get through the um, learning curve by using managed services and the work has been done for you to kind of help you leapfrog and, and get beyond the, the training issues that kind of uh, pervade that area. And if I'll take advantage of all the cloud resources that are out there, um, take advantage of all the resources that are here today, and I look forward to talking to you guys and, and, and have a great show and, and conference. So thank you. All right, thank you very much, Bob. So we're going to cover a little bit about logistics. That mic is not on number four. About logistics right. for the event, um, for all the folks here. One of the things which we want to announce is uh, the availability of Oracle Database 18C XC, a free edition of the Oracle Database, fully free to develop and, and run applications against. The other thing we have is LiveSQL Oracle.com, a SQL scratch pad on the web. If you just want to write some SQL or something, you go to LiveSQL.Oracle.com, you get the latest Oracle database, and you can get started writing some SQL. You can save your scripts, you can share it with your colleagues, and so forth. And we also have the Java 12 release, which just came out. So um, give this a try. There are 16 new JEPs that are released as part of this 
Um, of course, flight recorders included, HTTP and URL support, better support for um, Japanese multi-language, and you can download and be a contributor at openjdk.java.net. And if you want to know how to become a groundbreaker, what you have just heard, uh, head over to developer.oracle.com where you can find out more about the technologies that Oracle offers to developers so that you can get started as well and hopefully become a groundbreaker as well. Yeah, I think the, the key to becoming a groundbreaker is, um, here, turn around, Gerald. Put, putting a nice sticker on the back of your T-shirt and augmenting your T-shirt. <laughs> that's, the, <laughs> that's my chat pack. <laughs> that's the secret. Um, so we also have a great Zip Labs challenge. We have um, three of the rebound tag logic tags we're giving out to folks who complete the most Zip Labs today. So if you lose your luggage, as, as I often do, um, you need one of these. So hang out, check one of the Zip Labs is a great way to learn about our cloud native offerings, which Bob was talking a bit about. Um, we, of course, also have um, the mobile app to learn more about the schedule for today. So in the mobile app, choose Oracle Code Roam. It'll give you the full schedule for the sessions today. Sessions are occurring in this room, and then the three rooms on the side of the exhibition hall. Um, also in the exhibition hall, we have the blockchain beer demo we talked about. We have the Pepper Chatbot robot. We have an awesome Smart City Lego project. And we have the personalized manufacturing demo, which is one of our most complicated demos. And you can get your custom printed um, beer coaster to go along with your blockchain beer, which is an important aspect. And actually, the beer is already flowing. Also, if you happen to be on Twitter, check out at Oracle Devs. Follow us, which is where we post all our collateral, etc. Stay engaged with the community. And also, please tweet with the hashtag groundbreakers. Groundbreaker or groundbreakers? I always forget. Groundbreakers. Groundbreakers with an S at the end. Uh, yeah, and I think last slide. Yeah, so um, for all the folks at the event here, you're pre-registered for $500 in Oracle Cloud credits. Um, go to oracle.com slash code19rom, and that'll get you your, um, your free offer. And while folks are taking a screenshot of this, which I see some folks, I forgot to mention the AR Charity Challenge. So we have a challenge going on. You will see these um, posters. You can use the AR Charity Challenge application. We have a kiosk to explain the details. We are um, donating to Technovation, which is a group which um, supports women who code based on the number of um, virtual conference, um, um, the, the virtual leaderboard, which we have running here for all the attendees of the event. So um, if you see those around, use your phone and the Irish Charity Challenge app to contribute to a great cause. So thank you guys very much for joining us for the keynotes. And we hope to see you at the sessions this afternoon. Please enjoy the conference. Thank you. Grazie mille.